Steam enters a nozzle at 400 degrees Celsius and 800 kilopascals with a velocity of 10 meters per second and leaves at 300 degrees Celsius and 200 kilopascals while losing heat at a rate of 25 kilowatts. For an inlet area of 800 square centimeters, determine the velocity and volumetric flow rate of the steam at the nozzle exit. So let's parse that into pieces. First of all, we recognize that we were given a working fluid, it's steam. I will remind you that when we talk about water, we typically describe it as water, but it's very common in the thermodynamic industry to refer to both liquid and vaporous water as steam, especially during the transition period. In applications like steam power plants, steam is the description for all of the water regardless of phase. So don't read too much into the fact that the working fluid is described as steam. Don't let that imply to you that it is a superheated vapor, even though it probably is considering it's 400 degrees Celsius and 800 kilopascals. I was told in inlet temperature and pressure, those two independent intensive properties will fully define that state point. And at the inlet, I also known a velocity and a cross-sectional area. I was told at the outlet, the temperature and pressure, which again, fully define state two, and I was told that throughout the process, we are rejecting heat at a rate of 25 kilowatts. All of this is occurring inside of a nozzle. And a nozzle is one of our steady flow devices. If we jump over to our list of steady flow devices, we can see that a nozzle's goal is to convert enthalpy to kinetic energy. I mean, if you think about the nozzle on the end of a garden hose, for example, the goal of that nozzle is to increase the velocity of that stream of water. That increase in kinetic energy has to draw its energy from somewhere. The place that it gets its energy to accomplish that increase in velocity is the enthalpy of the fluid. Remember that we define enthalpy as the combination of internal energy and what we call flow energy, which is pressure and specific volume. So anything within that could decrease to increase the kinetic energy of the fluid. However, if we think about the fact that over the course of a nozzle, we aren't drastically changing the temperature, we're probably unlikely to change the density as much as the pressure. Therefore, the primary source of the energy is going to be the pressure of the fluid. So we're decreasing the enthalpy of the fluid to increase the kinetic energy. In this problem statement, we were told enough information to figure out how much the enthalpy decreased across the process. And with that information, we can figure out how much the kinetic energy had to increase. So that's going to be the beginning of the problem. The second half of the problem asks us for the volumetric flow rate, which we can use the velocity at the outset, the outlet of the nozzle, as well as the specific volume of the water, which we can look up using the temperature and pressure to figure out what that volumetric flow rate has to be. So let's get into it. I'll start by drawing a rough diagram of the nozzle. We traditionally draw our nozzles and diffusers as simply increasing or decreasing their cross-sectional area and we typically draw them from left to right. So I can indicate an inlet on the left and an outlet on the right. And I will describe those two state points as one and two respectively. So those state points are referring to different positions in space, not necessarily different positions in time. Since I'm commonly analyzing nozzles and diffusers as being steady state, because there's unlikely to be much interesting change over time, especially after the beginning of the process, the transient period of the process, these two state points could be described at the same point in time. We could be talking about different water at the inlet than at the outlet at the same point in time. So different positions in space. Those two state points have a temperature and pressure, State one's temperature and pressure are 400 degrees Celsius and 800 kilopascals, which we can use with our steam tables to look up any other property that we need, like for example, the enthalpy and the specific volume. We also know the velocity and the cross-sectional area at state one. Those are 10 meters per second, I'm pretty sure, yep. Yeah. And 800 square centimeters. Then at state two, I know the temperature and pressure are 300 degrees Celsius 
and 200 kilopascals. Then again, those two independent intensive properties fully define my state point from which I can determine any other piece of information I want to know. Probably enthalpy, probably specific volume. Generally speaking, I would encourage you to get as far in the problem as you can symbolically before you start going into the property table lookups because it can be easy to waste time and effort looking at properties that you don't necessarily need. So even though I haven't drawn out a mass balance or an energy balance yet, I've drawn out H1 and V1, H2 and V2 as properties that I'm looking up. If I go through the process and change my mind about those properties, I can always go back and remove them from my lookup list. While we're here, it's a good idea to start listing our assumptions as well. I'll start by considering the fact that I'm treating this process as steady state. So I'm neglecting the effects of time in my analysis. Now the context clues for that are the fact that steady is in the description of a steady flow device. We treat them as being steady state. Second of all, I recognize that there's not really anything interesting for the nozzle to do over time. We have an inlet, we have an outlet, and we're described properties of the inlet and outlet regardless of when we look at it. Furthermore, we know the rate of heat rejection, which is independent of time. It's 25 kilojoules of heat rejected every second, 25 kilowatts, regardless of if that's the first second or the 100th second. So steady state is the first assumption that we make. Next, I could establish that I'm treating this as an open system. That's not really an assumption that I'm making. Remember, the default state of the universe is an open system. When we simplify an open system to a closed system or an isolated system, that's really the assumption that we're making. We are neglecting some aspects of reality in our model. When we treat this as an open system, what we're really saying is, we aren't neglecting mass crossing the boundary, nor energy crossing the boundary. But just in the interests of being extra explicit about my assumptions, I'll list it just in case. To this list, I could add the fact that we were told a heat rejection, and there's unlikely to be heat transfer going in multiple directions. And if there was a situation that was complicated enough to warrant heat transfer in multiple directions, I would probably have enough information to, to describe that in the problem. That special circumstance would warrant description. So I'll add to my list of assumptions that there is likely to be only heat transfer in the outward direction, therefore no QN. While I'm here, I can also probably pretty safely assume that because we weren't told any work occurring in the process, there is unlikely to be any work occurring in the process, therefore no work of any sort. Next up, I recognize that in my process, I am unlikely to have any substantial change in potential energy. Now I drew my nozzle as being horizontal, which pretty explicitly means no change in elevation, but that wasn't actually given in the problem statement. We weren't told a change in elevation. And the fact that we weren't told a change in elevation implies to us that there isn't a substantial change in elevation, so we shouldn't have to try to account for that because we have no ability to do that anyway. So I'll add to my list, no change in potential energy. And let's see how far that gets us. So we have state one properties, state two properties. We've started some assumptions. Now let's set up an energy balance. The energy balance will allow us to relate the change in enthalpy to the change in kinetic energy. So let's start with our energy balance. My energy balance has to be performed on something. I'm defining my system as a control volume here instead of a control mass because I'm accounting for mass crossing my boundary. So I will indicate on my nozzle my control volume and recognize that there is mass crossing the boundary in the inward direction at state 1. There is mass crossing the boundary in the hour direction at state 2. And then there is also a heat rejection term. That's actually a rate 
of heat rejection. So I will indicate that as a capital Q dot out to indicate total rate of change of energy. If I wanted to, I could add to this the actual amount. It is 25 kilowatts, but I don't necessarily have to. Lastly, while I'm here, it's pretty common to indicate the working fluid on your system diagram. So we've indicated a nozzle as evidenced by the fact that our cross-sectional area is decreasing. We have an inlet and outlet state point. We've indicated that it's water and that there's heat rejection. Now, energy balance. Delta E of our control volume is equal to E in minus E out. I recognize that because I'm describing this process as being steady state, I can probably use the rate form of my energy balance. So I'm going to divide everything by dt. At which point I have the rate of change of the energy of the control volume with respect to time is equal to e dot in minus e dot out. My first simplification will come by recognizing that if I'm assuming steady state analysis, nothing can change with respect to time. The temperature at any given point can't change with respect to time. The density of the water at any given point can't change with respect to time. And in fact, the energy of the control volume cannot change with respect to time. So I will indicate that I'm neglecting the rate of change of energy of the control volume with respect to time because of assumption number one. That means the rate of energy entering has to equal the rate of energy exiting. Next, I recognize that because I have an open system, energy can cross the boundary in either direction in the form of heat transfer, work, or the energy associated with a moving mass. So E dot in could be heat transfer in, it could be work in, the rate of work in, and it could also be the sum in of m dot theta. Heat transfer, work, and the energy associated with a moving mass. I will move that a little bit more to the left so that my equal signs remain lined up. E dot out, likewise, could be u dot out. It could be work dot out. And it could be the energy associated with the exiting mass. Next, I'll neglect terms that aren't relevant to the problem at hand. I recognize that I had assumed that heat transfer was only in the outward direction, so we can get rid of Q in. That was on account of assumption number three. I'm neglecting work altogether because of assumption number four. And I can simplify my summation of mass flow rate entering and exiting by accounting for all of the places where mass is entering. That is just state one. So m dot one, theta one. And then all of the locations where mass is exiting my system. Which is just state two. Then I can expand theta. Theta is the combination of the enthalpy of the fluid plus the kinetic energy of the fluid on a specific basis plus the potential energy of the fluid on a specific basis. So that would be H1 plus V1 squared over 2 plus GZ1. For theta 2, that would be H2 plus V2 squared over 2 plus gravity times Z2. So plugging those substitutions in, I have m dot 1 times H1 plus V1 squared over 2 plus GZ1 is equal to U dot out plus m dot 2 times H2 plus V2 squared over 2 excellent looking square plus gz2 and again i will move that over to keep my equal signs aligned my next simplification will come from recognizing that 
we had neglected any changes in potential energy. That was, I believe, assumption number five. I'm just gonna write down a five. All confident like and scroll over to find that I was correct. Next, I recognize that for there to be an equal rate of mass entering and exiting, which comes from the mass balance, by the way. Can write that out in the same way I did my energy balance. I can say the change in mass of my control volume is equal to the mass entering my control volume minus the mass exiting my control volume. And because I'm assuming steady state analysis, it's going to be more convenient for me to use the rate form of the mass balance, so I will divide all three terms by dt. At which point I have the rate of change of mass of the control volume with respect to time. The rate of mass flow rate entering and exiting. And then I will neglect dm dt on account of the steady state assumption. Therefore, all of the mass flow rate entering has to equal all of the mass flow rate exiting. I only have one inlet state point, that's state one. I only have one exiting state point, that is state two. So m.1 has to equal m.2, which I will just start writing as m. Dot, the only mass flow rate. So back in my energy balance, if m.1 is equal to m.2, it might be convenient for me to combine these terms and these terms together. I could do that in a couple of ways. I could subtract m.2 times h2 plus v2 squared over two from both sides of the equation and factor out the mass flow rate. I could also divide all three terms by m. dot, Like this. At which point I would just have h1 plus v1 squared over 2 is equal to q dot out divided by mass flow rate plus h2 plus v2 squared over 2. In this equation, I know v1. I have the ability to look up h1. I have the ability to look up h2 and I know q dot out. So I could calculate v2 from this equation if I knew m dot. Luckily for us, we have enough information to describe m dot. We could describe m dot one by relating mass flow rate to volumetric flow rate. That would be density times volumetric flow rate. And then I could recognize that volumetric flow rate itself could be described as velocity times cross-sectional area. Then mass flow rate could be written as density times velocity times cross-sectional area, or more conveniently for us, velocity times cross-sectional area divided by a specific volume. So we could calculate the mass flow rate at state one, which is the same as the mass flow rate at state two, if we knew velocity at state one, which we do, we were given it, area at state one, which we do, we were given it, and specific volume at state one. So if we look up specific volume at state one, we can calculate the mass flow rate at state one, which we can plug into our energy balance, along with the H1 and H2, which we look up at states one and two, and calculate the velocity at state two. So rearranging this equation, I could write v2 squared over 2 is equal to h1 minus h2 minus q dot out divided by mass flow rate plus v1 squared over 2. So the kinetic energy term at state 2 is going to be equal to the change in enthalpy 
plus the specific kinetic energy term at state one. And then we also account for the fact that we are losing energy over the course of the process as a result of heat transfer out. So the presence of heat transfer out is decreasing how much kinetic energy there is left at the end, which makes sense. I could go one step further and write this as V2 is equal to the square root of 2 times the quantity H1 minus H2 minus Q dot out over M dot plus V1 squared over 2. Now all I need to do is look up H1, H2, and specific volume 1, calculate M dot, and plug everything into my equation. I will also point out while I'm here, in some circumstances it's easier to calculate V2 squared as a quantity in meter squared per second squared and then square root that term. Sometimes it can be difficult to keep track of the unit conversion underneath the radical. So pros and cons, I prefer typically to perform as few calculations as possible. So we'll leave that the way it is for now. Next up, I can recognize that at the end of the process, I'm going to be looking for the volumetric flow rate at the exit. And to figure out the volumetric flow rate at the exit, I'm going to recognize that I have enough information to calculate the mass flow rate at the exit. So just like we did with M.1, we can look up the specific volume at state 2 and relate the mass flow rate at state 2 to the volumetric flow rate at state 2 with the specific volume. So M.2 is going to equal density times volumetric flow rate at state 2, which is the same as volumetric flow rate at state 2 divided by specific volume at state 2. Then the volumetric flow rate at state 2 would be the mass flow rate at state 2 times the specific volume at state 2. We will know the mass flow rate at state 2 because we will have calculated the mass flow rate at state 1 at this point, and we recognize that they are the same quantity because the mass has nowhere else to go. So once we know m.1, we know m.2, we multiply that by the specific volume at state 2, and we have the answer for the volumetric flow rate at the exit of the nozzle. So all that's left to do, really, is look up H1, specific volume 1, H2, and specific volume 2. For that, we will jump into our property lookup tables. We're going to be using the properties of water, so we're going to pay attention to tables A2 through about A5 on this list. The first step is going to be fixing the phase at state 1. So in state 1, I had a temperature of 400 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 800 kilopascals. The easiest way to fix state 1 is probably to look up the saturation temperature corresponding to the pressure or the saturation pressure corresponding to my temperature and compare one to the other. So I will use my pressure to look up a saturation temperature at that pressure and I will compare my temperature to that saturation temperature. So in the tables, if I go to my saturation tables listed in order of pressure, remember that table A2 and A3 contain the same information or rather are referring to the same information, one is given in even increments of pressure, one is given in even increments of temperature. So what I want is table A3. On table A3, I find 8 bar, because 800 kilopascals would be 8 bar, and I see that the saturation temperature corresponding to 8 bar is 170.4 degrees Celsius. My temperature is 400 degrees Celsius, state 1. 400 degrees Celsius is higher than the saturation temperature, therefore this must be a superheated vapor. So I will go now into my superheated vapor tables. In my superheated vapor tables, I want to find 8 bar so that I can look up my enthalpy and specific volume at that pressure. Unfortunately, I see that I don't have, happen to have a pressure subtable for 8 bar. Instead, I have a pressure subtable at 7 bar and a pressure subtable at 10 bar. So in order to look up the property at 400 degrees Celsius and 8 bar, I'm going to have to interpolate between the two pressure subtables. So if I go back into my property lookups, I will draw that out. 
maybe down here. Property lookups. It's day one. I'm using a temperature of 400 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 8 bar. And then from my superheated vapor tables, which are tables A4, I'm interpolating between 7 bar and 10 bar. So my interpolation will be 8 minus 7 divided by 10 minus 7 is equal to H1 minus the specific enthalpy at 400 degrees Celsius and 7 bar, which is 3,268.7. 3,268.7. Divided by the specific enthalpy at 10 bar and 400 degrees Celsius, which would be 3,263.9. minus the same enthalpy at 7 bar and 400 degrees Celsius, which is 3,268.7. That proportion of the way we are between the two pressure subtables is assumed to be the same as the proportion we are between the enthalpy at the two pressure subtables. And it is also the same as the proportion we are between these specific volumes at the two pressure subtables. So adding to this, I could write V1 minus the specific volume at 7 bar and 400 degrees Celsius, which would be 0 0.4397. 0 0.4397. Divided by the specific volume at 400 degrees Celsius and 10 bar, which would be 0 0.3066. Zero point three zero six six minus the same specific volume from the seven bar subtable. And that gives me my two proportions. So I'm going to use this one equation with one unknown to calculate H1. And I will use this other one equation with one unknown to calculate V1. So if I pull up my calculator here, I am going to cheat a little bit by instead of doing the algebra, I will just type out the equation symbolically and let the calculator solve for it. Thirty two sixty eight point seven divided by thirty two sixty three point nine minus thirty two sixty eight point seven. And then we are solving that for X. We are forgetting parentheses. Okay, so eight minus 7 divided by 10 minus 7 is equal to x minus 3268.7 divided by 3263.9 minus 3268.7 and this is incorrect because I typed the negative sign instead of minus. I'm using a keyboard here to type in on a TI-89 emulator and some of the keys aren't exactly perfect. So look forward to more mistakes like that. 3,267.1 is my enthalpy. 3,267.1 kilojoules per kilogram. And now, the same thing with specific volume. So I will get rid of 3,268.7 and replace that with 0 0.4397. I'll get rid of 3263.9, replace that with 0 0.3066. And 
make the same substitution for 0 0.4397. And I get a specific volume at state 1 of 0 0.3953. 53. And then just for good measure, let's throw a couple extra 3s on. We are paying no attention to significant figures. Okay, now that I have H1 and V1, I'm about halfway through my property lookups, I can repeat the same general process at state 2. At state 2, I had a temperature of 300 degrees Celsius. And a pressure at state 2 of 2 bar. Right? 2 bar? Yep, 2 bar. And from that, I can perform a property lookup. So just like at state 1, the first step is to fix the phase. It's likely to still be a superheated vapor, but we should check just to be sure. So I will jump back into my saturation tables. And again, I could look up the saturation temperature corresponding to my pressure and then compare that to my temperature. Or I could look up the saturation pressure corresponding to my temperature and compare that to my pressure. So at 2 bar, I see that the saturation temperature is 120.2 degrees Celsius. My temperature at state 2 is higher than that because 300 is higher than 120.2. Therefore, it must be a superheated vapor. I will jump into my superheated vapor tables again, and I will scan optimistically for a superheated vapor subtable at 2 bar. And unfortunately, I don't find one. Instead, I see that I have a pressure subtable at 1.5 bar and a pressure subtable at 3 bar. I have a direct row for 400 degrees Celsius, which means that my interpolation is only going to be one dimensional. So that interpolation will look the same as it did before. I will start off with 2 minus 1.5 divided by 3 minus 1.5. And that's going to be equal to the enthalpy at 1.5 and 400. That enthalpy is going to be the third column on my subtable. So the enthalpy at 1.5 bar and 400 degrees Celsius is 3277.4. So H2 minus... 3277.4 divided by the enthalpy at 3 bar and 400 degrees Celsius, which would be 3275.0. 3275.0 minus the enthalpy at 1.5 bar and 400 degrees Celsius, which was 3277.4. And the proportion of the way we are between the 1.5 pressure subtable and the three bar pressure subtable is assumed to be the same for both enthalpy and specific volume. So you can interpolate for specific volume using the same proportion. That would be V2 minus the specific volume at 1.5 bar and 400 degrees Celsius, which is 2.067. Generally speaking, we should pay attention to the specific volume column to see if we are multiplying it by 10 to the negative third or not. And we are not here, so that's just going to be 2.067. Divided by the specific volume at 3 bar and 400 degrees Celsius, which is 1.032. Minus the same specific volume from earlier, 2.067. And now, can interpolate for H2 and V2. So I will start with the same solve function as earlier. And I will say 2, correct minus sign, 1.5, divided by 3, correct minus sign, 1.5 is equal to the thing that we're solving for, minus 3277.4, divided by 3275.0, correct minus sign, 3277.4, we're solving for x. 
So H2 is going to be 3276.6 kilojoules per kilogram. And V2. Two point zero six seven, one point zero three two, and two point zero six seven. Specific volume of state two is one point seven two two. One point seven two two cubic meters per kilogram, and that gives us what the property lookups that we need to perform our energy balance and. Calculate volumetric flow rate at state two. Let's just double check that we grab the correct numbers of 400 degrees Celsius and eight bar, 400 degrees Celsius and eight bar, and 300 degrees Celsius and two bar, 300 degrees Celsius and two bar. Then let's look at the changes in our numbers to see if that matches what we would expect. We see that our specific enthalpy is going from 3267.1 to 3276.2. So we are increasing our specific enthalpy. That is a bad sign. That is an indication that we are increasing our kinetic energy and our enthalpy while rejecting heat throughout the process. So we need to go back and double check our numbers. To do that, I will jump back into the property tables. And let's first look at our superheated water vapor tables at 8 bar. We were interpolating between 3268.7, 3268.7, and 3263.9, 3263.9, 3263.9. Yep, so 3267.1 seems reasonable. I see that I should be about a third of the way between 68.7 and 63.9. The difference between those two is roughly five, a third of the way. Of five would be about one and a half, so we should be about one and a half less than 68.7, which we are, which means H1 is probably correct. Then at state two, we were interpolating between 1.5 and 3. 1.5 and 3. Our two values were 3277.4, 3277.4, and 3275.0, 3275.0. So our interpolation should be about a third of the way between 77.4 and 75.0. A third of the way between the two should yield, oh, about one and a half. Are we decreasing by one and a half? Not quite. Let's just double check that interpolation here. Two minus 1.5 divided by three minus 1.5 is equal to x minus 3277.4 divided by 3275, 3275 minus 3277.4, 3276.6, 400 degrees. Oh, right. The property lookup at state two is at 300 degrees Celsius, not 400 degrees Celsius. Well, that was a very humbling experience. Let's try that again. This time, we are looking at 280 and 320. So, you know, I do have the technology. I could cut that out of the video, but I think in the interests of demonstrating the, the thought process behind verifying your numbers, I'm gonna leave that error in. That totally intentional error for the purposes of learning. Yes, 300 is not 400. <sighs> okay. So, let's try that process again. All of this is wrong. Instead, I need to perform an interpolation between the 280 row and the 320 row to find our value at 300 degrees Celsius. And then I need to perform the same interpolation on the three bar table at 280 and 320 to find our value at 300 degrees Celsius. And then we're going to interpolate between those two resulting values. So we are interpolating 
between 280 and 320 on one pressure subtable, between 280 and 320 on the other pressure subtable, and then we are interpolating between those two resulting values. So I would describe this as an H style triple interpolation. H because we are essentially drawing an uppercase H between our pressure subtables. Alternatively, we could also look up a value at 280 degrees Celsius at two bar, a value at 320 degrees Celsius at two bar, and then interpolate between those two values, which would create the shape of an uppercase I. Either way works, they will produce the same result, but H is what I'm going to do here. So our first interpolation is going to be for a value at 300 degrees Celsius and 1.5 bar. So H at 300 degrees Celsius and 1.5 bar. Then we're going to perform a second interpolation for H at 300 degrees Celsius and 1.5, excuse me, 3 bar. And then we're going to interpolate between those two values. And that third interpolation would be 2 minus 1.5 divided by 3 minus 1.5 is equal to the enthalpy at state 2 minus the enthalpy at 300 degrees Celsius and 1.5 bar divided by the enthalpy at 300 degrees Celsius and 3 bar minus the enthalpy at 300 degrees Celsius and 1.5 bar. So we perform two intermediate lookups to be able to perform our actual lookup for enthalpy. So going back to our property tables, we're going to start by interpolating for a value at 300 degrees Celsius, 1.5 bar. We are building the left leg of our H. So for that, we'll take 300 minus 280 divided by 320 minus 280 is equal to x correct minus sign the value of h at 280 and 1.5 bar which would be 3032.8 divided by the value of h at 320 degrees celsius and 1.5 bar which would be 3113.5 minus 3032.8 we are solving for x so our first lookup is 3073.15. 3073.15. And if you're doing this correctly, you should hear a cat desperately wanting to go outside. That is a good sign. It means you're doing thermodynamics right. Then our interpolation for three bar will be the same proportion on the left. But on the right, that will be 3,028.6 divided by 3,110.1 minus 3,028.6. We are solving for x. 3,028.6. Nope. Okay, try that again. Twenty-eight point six. Three one one zero point one. Three thousand twenty-eight point six. Okay, three thousand sixty-nine point three five. Point three five. Now we have everything we need to actually perform. The lookup for H2, that would be H2 minus 3073.15 divided by 3069.35 minus 
a third interpolation here. That's going to be... Two minus correct minus sign 1.5 divided by 3 minus 1.5 and that is equal to x minus 3073.15 divided by 3069.35 minus 3073.15 we're solving for x 3071.88 3071.88 kilojoules Per kilogram. So we are going from 32,067.1 kilojoules per kilogram at the inlet to 3,071.88 kilojoules per kilogram at the outlet. We are decreasing the enthalpy, and that energy is going into heat transfer out as well as kinetic energy increase. The fact that our enthalpy is decreasing means that we are more likely to have done that correctly. Okay, now let's repeat that process for specific volume. We are going to be determining a specific volume at 1.5 bar. Actually, you know what? Just to demonstrate both aspects of interpol interpolation process, let's do this I style instead of H style. So what I'm going to be doing this time is determining a specific volume at 2 bar and 300 degrees Celsius. Excuse me, 280 degrees Celsius. And a specific volume at 2 bar and 320 degrees Celsius. And then we are interpolating between those two results to come up with our specific volume at state 2. And that interpolation would be 300 minus 280 divided by 320 minus 280 is equal to specific volume at state 2 minus specific volume at 2 bar, 280 degrees Celsius, divided by specific volume at 2 bar, 320 degrees Celsius, minus specific volume at 2 bar, 280 degrees Celsius. So, two intermediate lookups in order to be able to actually evaluate the third lookup. Jumping back into our property tables, the first lookup goes... Solve. And then, for 2 bar and 280 degrees Celsius, we're going to take 2 minus 1.5. Correct minus sign is important. Divided by 3 minus 1.5. And that's equal to x minus, correct, minus sign, the value for specific volume at 280 degrees Celsius and 1.5, which would be 1.695. Let's just double check that that's not taken times 10 to the negative third. It isn't. And then we are dividing that by the specific volume at 280 degrees Celsius and 3 bar, which would be 0.844. Minus the same specific volume from earlier, 1.695. We're solving that for x, and our first value is 1.41133. 41133 cubic meters per kilogram. And then we will repeat that same process. So that would be all 2 minus 1.5, correct minus sign. Divided by 3 minus 1.5 is equal to x minus the value at 320 degrees Celsius and 1.5 bar, which would be 311, excuse me, specific volume, John, 1.819, correct minus sign, 1.819 divided by 0 0.907 minus 1 point, no, 1.819. Solving that for x, we get 1.515. 1.515. Now, 300, excuse me, 300 minus 280 divided by 320 minus 280 is equal to 
V2 minus the specific volume at 2 bar and 280 degrees Celsius, which was 1.41133, divided by 1.515 minus 1.4. 1133, and that will give us V2. So we have 300 minus 280, correct minus sign, divided by 320 minus 280 is equal to X minus 1.41133, divided by 1.515 minus 1.41133. We get 1.46317. 1.46317 cubic meters per kilogram. So we have an H1 of 3267.1. I'm going to highlight that to make it easier to graph from the other side. A V1 of 0 0.395333. A specific volume of 1.46317 and an enthalpy at state 2 of 3071.88. And our numbers seem reasonable. We are increasing our specific enthalpy and we are increasing our specific volume. Excuse me, decreasing our specific enthalpy, increasing our specific volume. Now we can calculate a mass flow rate at state 1 so that we can plug that into our energy balance. So we're going to take our specific volume is state 1, 0 0.395333, and put that in the denominator with the velocity of state 1, which was 10 meters per second, and the area at state 1, which was 800 square centimeters. So we have 10 meters per second multiplied by 800 centimeters squared divided by 0 0.395333. 0 0.395333 cubic meters per kilogram. We are likely looking for a mass flow rate in kilograms per second. It doesn't really matter because that isn't explicitly asked for. All we're doing is taking this number and plugging it into our energy balance. So we can use whichever units we prefer, but kilograms per second is probably going to be easiest. To do that, I will convert centimeters to meters. For that, I recognize that there are 100 centimeters in one meter. Then I square everything. One squared is boring. 100 squared, centimeters squared, cancel centimeters squared. Meters squared and meters cancel the cubic meters in the denominator, which gives me kilograms per second. So I am going to take 10 multiplied by 800 divided by the quantity 0 0.395333 times 100 squared. 100 squared. Really? I can't do the caret? Okay, I guess I will do that manually. Squared. So 10 times 800 divided by 0 0.3395333 times 100 squared gives me a mass flow rate of 2.35618. And let's write that here. 2.35618 kilograms per second. 2.35618 kilograms per second will go here. I have 25 kilowatts as a Q dot out. I have 10 meters per second as a V1. I have H1 and H2 from our property lookups, which means we have everything we need to calculate V2. So that will go square root and then two times the quantity H1 minus H2. H1 was 3267.1. 3267.1 minus H2, which was 3071.88. Three thousand seventy one point eight eight kilojoules per kilogram. And now let's think about what units we want underneath our radical here. So we're going to be taking 
a quantity in specific energy, and we are going to take that to the power of one half. As a result of that, we want meters per second. So the most convenient thing for us to use under the square root sign is going to be meters squared per second squared. If we get this into meters squared per second squared, then when we perform the square root, we will end up with meters per second. So I want to get from kilojoules per kilogram into meters squared per second squared. For that, I will recognize that one kilojoule is a thousand joules. A joule is a newton times a meter. And a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Newtons cancels newtons, joules cancels joules, kilojoules cancels kilojoules. Kilograms cancels kilograms, leaving me with meters times meters, or meters squared, divided by second squared. One quantity in, two more to go. Then I'm subtracting, I will carry that two over, and write that as two times. 25 kilowatts. Divided by mass flow rate, which was 2.35618. And that was kilograms per second. We're going to run out of room, so I'll break that into the next line. A kilowatt can be written as a kilojoule per second, at which point we are back to the same unit conversion as earlier. A kilojoule is a thousand joules. A joule is a newton times a meter. And a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Kilojoules cancels kilojoules, joules cancels joules, newtons cancels newtons, seconds and seconds cancel. Kilograms and kilograms cancel, kilowatts cancels kilowatts, leaving me with meter squared per second squared. And then I add to that two again, multiplied by v1 squared over two. N squared. Meters squared per second squared divided by two. I want meters squared per second squared and I have meters squared per second squared. I can cancel the two. I will continue the radical just to hopefully not forget it. And at this point, I can perform that calculation. So I will leave my square root as parentheses with a to the power of one half at the end, just to hopefully make this as easy to read on the calculator as possible. So we start with two times, and actually, we could write that factor, or I guess we can leave it. B. Huh, interesting. Wonder why it was B. Anyway, 3267.1 minus 3071.88 multiplied by 1000. That'll give me my first quantity. And then we are subtracting, correct, sub, subtraction sign, John. 2 times 25 times 1000 divided by 2.35618. And then we add to that A. Huh. I wonder why those letters appear. That's interesting. 2 times 10 squared. Can't use the caret. Have to use to the to the power of 2. And then divided by 2, I will just get rid of the 2. And I close my parentheses and raise that to the power of 1 half at the end. And I get 607.716. Let's just double check. 2 times 3267.1 minus 3071.88 times 1,000 minus 2 times 25 times 1,000 divided by 2.35618 plus 10 squared. All inside parentheses raised to the 1 half power, which gives me 607.716. So, the velocity at the exit of the nozzle is 607.72 meters per second. Then our volumetric flow rate at state 2 will be the mass flow rate at state 2 multiplied by the specific volume at state 2. The mass flow rate at state 2 is the same as the mass flow rate at state 1, which is 2.35618 kilograms per second.
And then our specific volume of state two was 1.46317. One point four six three one seven cubic meters per kilogram. Kilograms cancels kilograms, leaving me with cubic meters per second. Two point three five six one eight times one point four six three one seven point three five six one eight times one point four six three one seven gives us three point four four seven five. 3.4475 cubic meters per second. The volume intercalorated state 2. Just double check that we typed those in correctly. 2.35618 and 1.46317. We did. That's a good sign. And then I will box the velocity at state 2 as well. And there we go. The velocity at the exit is just over 600 meters per second. The volumetric flow rate at the end is 3.45 cubic meters per second.